This is Bishop Gregory Brewer's teaching at a healing service January 14th, 2014 at All Saints Episcopal Church, Winter Park, Florida. This is part one of a two-part series. This is two nights. Um, this is night one. So we'll see what God does tonight and what God does tomorrow night. Um, I, need you, I want you to know that for me this is a kind of adventure. And, and I love it. Uh, I, I look to see what God might decide to do. Which way he may choose to take things. And my job is to try to keep up, quite honestly, uh, with what I see God doing. That more often than not, my prayer is, oh Lord, God, just keep me in step here. Um, because I am really not the one in control. Even though I'm, I am the bishop, I am not the one in control. And God help us all if I ever take that control. <laughs> but instead, my job is to yield. All the time. Whatever he wants, whatever he wants to do, the connections he wants to make, and not just within the context of this rather lovely church, but that's also, by God's mercy, to be co-equally true when I go to dinner after this is over. So that wherever we plan to eat, there's some of us that are getting together at a restaurant, that's God's just as present there. And my job is to be available for him there in actually the very same way that I am here. Because he is the Lord of heaven and earth. He, he's not just the Lord of the Christians gathered together in buildings sanctified for that purpose. There, there are no, you see, geographic um, distinctions when it comes to the presence of God. There are places like this where our senses have been trained over time to be more open to his presence. And so the iconography and the stained glass, the, the hallowedness of this space invites us. But that has everything to do with the fact that we have been trained and invited to enter in with symbols that for many of us are really quite familiar. But the danger of such a training is, is that it might shield us to the presence of God in the restaurant, or the bar, or the supermarket, or the club, or on the street when we're chatting with our neighbors. And that would be an understanding of God's presence that's quite foreign to the New Testament. So my, my job is to be available for him wherever he decides for me to go. Because you see, if you've seen the flyers, the title for these two evenings, is taking our place in the healing ministry of Jesus. And if you look at Jesus, it really didn't matter where he was. It was, it was the same Jesus, regardless. And in fact, that was a part of the scandal of it, because he dealt with Gentiles in a very similar kind of way. He ministered to the prostitutes in a, certain, in a similar kind of way. In other words, the caliber, the quality, the character of Jesus' words and works were never predicated on his audience unless they refused. And there is that awful, awful time when Jesus, in essence, goes back to his hometown. And they said, and it says very clearly that he could do no mighty works there except to heal a few sick people, which for us would feel like the pinnacle. You know, God help us. We're hoping people are going to be so my job is to be available for him. And I also want to say to you, and this is really the attention that, that I, where I want to go, if, if you're interested particularly in being a part of taking your place in the healing ministry of Jesus, a part of what is asked of you is that you learn the courageous posture of being the same person in Christ wherever you are. That you not play to your audience. You see, that's what was taught to me by the world, was the fact that I chose my vocabulary and the things that I talked about, and, and even down to who I was according to the crowd that I was with. So, and I knew how to do that actually really pretty well, especially by a college, as a college student. 
But what that invited for me was actually, especially as it came to issues of religious faith, a kind of schizophrenic existence where I, I, I taught Christianity to people who wanted to do that. But then I was a very different kind of person when I was other, with other groups of people because I felt like that was what the expectation was. That was never true for Jesus, you see. Jesus was always deeply and profoundly himself. And the self that I want to see cultivated is the self that is very sensitive to the leadership of God's direction. So that no matter wherever I am or with whom, if there is something that happens, and, and I listen for it actually, a, a note that is struck in a particular conversation, you know, if you pay attention, people drop incredible hints about what's really going on in their lives, as much as they try very hard to try to be sort of funny and nice all the time. I listen for those clues. I, I look at body language, and I'm really trusting the Lord to guide me so that I can speak to the real person, not just what I'm being presented, but the real person, wherever I am. Because you see, that's exactly what Jesus did. It, it's like the story of the woman at the well, you know, the story. You know, she's making conversations. She's got a stranger she doesn't know. And so she talks religion, she talks ethnicity, and Jesus just sort of cuts through it all and drops that little, well, you know, what I understand is that if you're living with somebody, you're not exactly married. In fact, you've married, been married, gosh, five times. And the man you're living with now isn't a husband of yours at all, is he? Well, that wasn't a part of the conversation, was it? <laughs> But it, it opened the door. God supernaturally showed him that piece of information about what was really happening in that woman's life. And as he said it, that opened the door for them to have a very different kind of conversation that they'd been having earlier. The earlier was polite, maybe even interesting, but it wasn't a life changer. And Jesus is all about being a life changer. He's never merely an entertainer. And that's what happened to this woman. Come and see this man who told me everything that I'd ever done. She became an evangelist. God used her to literally reshape the spiritual climate of her village. And it had everything to do with Jesus' willingness in the midst of a conversation around a well to move from banter because he could see the hunger in her heart to genuine dialogue. I have to tell you, that's, that's my hunger. <laughs> my, my wife will tell you, who's here this evening, um, that I, I occasionally talk and pray to waiters, pray with waiters, um, all, all, all sorts of people. You just never know. And especially, you see, now, I think this is very cogent now because we live in a climate that many of you know far better than me, where people who dress up like I am are held in extraordinary suspicion. Am I a financial swindler? Am I a pedophile? I mean, all kinds of pictures rise up in most people's minds. And they look up with the church with great suspicion. Even if they're spiritual hungry, there are plenty of people out in the world who wouldn't even consider the possibility of a church providing any answers for the spiritual hunger that they recognize as present inside, much less the people who don't. So there is a bridge, actually a gulf, not a bridge, that I have to find a way to cross to be able to talk to people who might be really interested in the conversation about Jesus but sure don't want to talk to a Christian, much less a bishop. <laughs> and God knows exactly how to do that. Exactly. Because, you see, those are the kind of people Jesus talked to. The people who really were very nervous about the religious leaders of his day, and in fact had been profoundly mistreated by them. Gentiles, prostitutes, the poor, the outcasts, people that the religious leaders thought were not worthy of the mercy of God because they had been cursed by them, either by them or directly or through a previous generation's sin. And so Jesus, who intentionally targeted the outsider, 
knew how to sit down with people who were not at all the synagogue crowd and strike up the kinds of conversations that actually wound up becoming life changers. I want to say to you, if there is any desire to take your place in the healing ministry of Jesus, it is this invitation to enter into what can only be described as the risky business of being available for God to use you at any moment, at any time, regardless of what your calendar says, regardless of what else is bothering you or knocking at your door. It's here am I, send me without qualifications. Now the good news is that God's pretty gentle with us. He builds... He begins with the more familiar. But he never, ever is content to stay there. And I say that because we have this impression of healing ministry, and it's not an, not an accurate one, that healing ministry has to do with something where Christians pray for other Christians to get well, and therefore they feel better, and as a result of being able to feel better, they can get about their normal life. Sorry, that's just not in here. It's much bigger than that. The healing ministry of Jesus is the manifestation of God's unconditional love for the entire world. And that healing ministry is meant to both affirm, number one, the truth of what Jesus says, the gospel. Remember Jesus says in John 14, 11, if you cannot believe me for my words, at least believe me for my works sake. And since particularly we live in a culture that is very suspicious about the very nature of words, you know, my truth, your truth, one of the ways that profoundly breaks through that kind of barrier has to do with just the testimony of, I once was blind, but now I see. If there is ever a time in the ministry of the church where the miraculous, life-changing, healing power of Christ should be breaking through as a sign to the world that what we preach and believe really is of Jesus, it is now. Otherwise, I just, for many, my, people might feel like I'm just trying to sell you something. So, the healing ministry of Jesus is actually one of God's ways of expressing his missionary compassion, literally for the entire world. Which is why, if you look at the healing ministry of Jesus, with relatively few exceptions, it was almost always public. No sparing someone from embarrassment and pulling off to a side room someplace. Everybody could see it so they could see the miracle. And as a result, what? Glorify God. Because you see, that's the end. The end is the expression of the miraculous specifically so that the missionary purposes of God are extended and manifested. It's really not about my learning how to get with somebody privately so that I can feel better. There's nothing wrong with that. But it's so paltry, paltry, in comparison to the missionary enterprise that God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever would believe in him would not perish and have everlasting life, and that the miracles are meant, in fact, to affirm the power of that message so that the more people know, the more they can come to faith in Christ. It really is a commitment to mission. Miracles, healings, affirming the very words and testimony of Jesus. Secondly, this ministry of healing is in fact meant to express the very heart of God's compassion. Healing ministry being acts of compassion that make visible the nature and ministry of Jesus. Jesus moved with compassion healed their sick. It happens again and again and again. And again, we're invited out in a pretty, pretty dangerous territory. See, compassion is risky business. If you begin to pray, which I hope you will, oh Lord, or just continue, work in me your compassion. Which is at the heart of healing ministry. Expect to be upended. 
It's not that you're somehow going to tack on healing ministry to the rest of your normal life. It doesn't work that way. You're upended. Because a part of what God begins to do is to challenge the places in you that in fact block compassion. My self-absorption. You know, I've got my list and these are the things I need to get done. And therefore, I want to make sure I can check those off by the end of the day because I have a responsibility to fulfill them. Here they are. Bing, 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 bing. And believe me, I believe in taking responsibility. If I didn't, my job description would be a mess. But I, I, I've had to come to understand. I, I want you to know I don't really like this. <laughs> but God doesn't care a lot about what I like and don't like sometimes. That many times the interruptions are in fact God's agenda for my day whether they're in my day planner or not, is actually quite a sad point. My self-absorption. Secondly, my delusions. My delusions that keep me from seeing the world as God sees it. I have a point of view. More than that, I have a lens through which I see the world. And it's not always geared in truth as much as I want it to be. It has everything to do with the ways, the way I was raised, the way life has been framed for me by my family, by my education, by my background, by the fact that I'm a man, by the fact that I'm an Episcopalian. All of those things shape the way I see the world. It's true for all of us. We all have them. Filters, some people. I need to face the fact that many, many times the way I look at life is actually based on how I want life to be. Even if that want is based in fear, rather than how, in fact, it really is. So God needs to get at that. You shall know the truth, and the truth will set you free. The Holy Spirit is called the Spirit of Truth. And so if I'm entering into this, then that means the Holy Spirit has to break down some of my delusions and speak truth to my life. And sometimes that's really hard. And then last, in fact, the worst, the self-control that I exert that somehow tries to bring my circumstances in line with my own desires, my own deluded desires that come from my own self-absorption. See, they're, they're all inextricably tied together. But they are the very things that block compassion because they are anti-compassion. They're way too self-protective. But you see, the good news is, is that because God really does love us, He doesn't want to leave us in those places, and He will break through. Open my heart, O oh God, to your compassion, is that God actually does begin to change our hearts and our perceptions. I want to quote Henri Nouwen here in his book, Reaching Out. He says, This kind of prayer is a great adventure because the God to whom we pray is greater than we are and defies all of our calculations and predictions. Praying for compassion takes us along a very difficult road because it leads us from an easy support system that we have created to very risky surrender. From the many safe gods of our own perceptions that we have created to the God of heaven and earth whose love has no limits. To participate in this ministry is to give ourselves over to something far bigger than ourselves. It is to partake of the Spirit of God. It is to say yes to God's mission, which encompasses all people everywhere. It is taking my place in God's larger enterprise, which is in fact the salvation of the whole world. Not just people like me. And you never know where God is going to take you. So the question is, are you up for that? That's what we're talking about if we're talking about the healing ministry of Jesus. It's not just prayer technique. God's bigger than that. Some of that's helpful. It, it's not even trying to create a certain adrenaline-controlled mood so I might be more open than otherwise. It helps us from getting, letting go of the distractions but again, I don't want to try to even control my own reactions. God, I want you to break through and do something real, not something I'm just deluding myself into feeling. We're talking reality here, not just an induced sense of calm. 
Because if it's not reality, I'm not interested. I can go to a movie and feel peaceful and weep. No, it's actually having the capital R Spirit of God touch our spirits in a way that changes us, and that's the healing, and propels us to be a part of His mission in the world. Are you up for that? Is it costly? Absolutely. This is why I had the Colossian lesson read. Paul talking very clearly about the price that he pays in being in God's mission, including suffering, including for which, for this I toil and struggle with all of the energy that he powerfully works within me. There is a price to be paid in this ministry. But is it worth it? I'd rather do this than anything else. I promise you. I promise you. Because the whole point of the ministry of Jesus is the last line of the gospel reading. For the Son of Man came to seek and save that which was lost. Whether it's a broken part of me that is estranged from God, whether it is a part of my physical body that has yet to know his miraculous power, whether it's a changing in my perception so I move from a fear-based life to a life of prayer and prayer that takes me places I never, ever thought that I would go. But if it's with God, why would I ever want to go anywhere else? In other words, to ask for prayer and to offer prayer comes with the price tag of being willing to be changed. Not just to feel better, but to be willing to be changed. Yeah, there's sometimes when God just gratuitously breaks through and does whatever he wants and people are healed and they go back and they're just as much pagan as they were when they left. That happens. But the real focus of this is the extension of God's mission, his kingdom, us being available for and to take our place in the healing ministry of Jesus is to say yes to that call, that enterprise. Where the blind see, the lame walk, sometimes literally. I can tell stories about that. And we say yes to not what we want to see happen, but what God does in a way that surprises delights, sometimes shatters, sometimes exalts. But it's always his doing. And Jesus is always glorified. Let us pray together. Gracious Lord, you who are on the move, extending your kingdom, opening hearts, creating hunger, Lord, give us the power, the grace, the mercy, and the courage to be a part of what it is that you are doing. Help us, O oh Lord, deal with our fears that cause us to tremble when we think about some of those things. And help us to learn more and more how to say yes. That people might be healed that they might be drawn to you, that your kingdom might be extended, and that people might rejoice because you are here. We commit ourselves into your hands, for it is in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, that we pray. Amen. Amen.